Uh, good afternoon. Welcome. Thanks for uh, joining us today for our webinar on uh, simplifying Medicare and Medicaid billing, a, a topic that a lot of practices uh, uh, wrestle with. Uh, I'm Paul Hartshe. I'm the CEO of RevCycle Partners. Um, and again, thanks for spending some time with us. Um, before we get started, uh, let's go over some uh, webinar logistics, if you will. First of all, everybody's muted, just given the quantity of people that are on. It uh, makes a lot uh, uh it makes the sound work a lot better if everybody's muted. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the, uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, so if you're familiar with GoToWebinar, there's a, uh, a window that you can enter questions in. Feel free to enter them along the way, and we will uh, package them up and, and uh, do a Q&A session at the end. Um, we are recording this. Um, so if you need to sneak out early or if you want to forward uh, the, the content to uh, appear somebody else in the office, uh, you'll be getting a link <coughs> to, uh, to a recording that you can, that you can do that with. Uh, RevCycle Partners, we're, a, we're an RCM vendor uh, specifically in the eye care space, serving eye care practices. Uh, we're a strategic partner with Rev360 and uh, we appreciate the opportunity Rev360 gives us to uh, reach out and and uh, provide these uh, webinar uh, settings uh, to uh, uh, their uh, Rev360 community. Um, our presenter today is Christine Schneider. Christine is a uh, co-founder and uh, the VP of Operations at RevCycle Partners. Uh, and in addition to Christine, we have Amanda Kissinger on the call or on the webinar. She'll be joining us and in, in, in answering uh, some, uh, helping out on the Q&A session uh, at the end. And so with that, we'll turn it over to Christine to get into the topic. Wonderful. Um, thanks, Paul. And a big thank you to everyone for taking the time to join our discussion today. Um, this slide outlines the flow of the webinar. We'll talk through some scenarios and ways to correct them. Medicare and Medicaid are a struggle for many offices, and it isn't just an issue or problem for the billers. It's an issue for everyone in the office since it affects the claim and payment, and it actually starts with the initial call for an appointment. The first scenario, picture there are, or excuse me, there are two main ways to obtain a patient's eligibility and benefit information from Medicaid. One is through their IVR phone system, and the other is through the Medicaid portal. The portal is by far the quickest and most efficient way to get information. So picture that a patient is seen in the office and they provide their Medicaid card. The office assesses the payer portal and verifies that the patient is eligible for the exam and has active coverage on the date of service. However, the office was not aware of managed care plans with Medicaid and does not pay attention to the bottom of the screen where it mentions the managed care plan that the patient is participating in. The claim is created and sent to process with Medicaid. A few, few weeks later, you receive an EOB denying the claim due to services covered under a managed care plan. The managed care plan happens to be a payer that the office is not credentialed with, and the only way to process an out-of-network claim is with a prior authorization. This particular Medicaid does not backdate authorizations. Had the office been aware of the managed care plan in the beginning, they could have obtained the prior auth to process the claim. A big part of that first scenario is training and continued training for all staff to understand what to look for and what it means. Because Medicaid has so many plans with different rules, that is a challenge many offices fail at. Another scenario, the front desk is scheduling an appointment and as part of the process, they ask the patient for all pertinent demographic information, including the all important question, what's your insurance? The patient is asked to bring all insurance cards to their visit. This particular patient is a senior citizen. They hear insurance and automatically say, I have Medicare. They bring in their Medicare card the front desk and or insurance person updates the file. The patient has their visit. Insurance is billed shortly after. A few days later, you receive a denial. Sure, this patient is correct that they have Medicare, but they actually have an Advantage plan, which replaces the billing of traditional Medicare. 
easy fix, right? Not necessarily. You can't get back the time and the money spent updating and filing that claim incorrectly. You now have to get a hold of the patient to get the right information, whether that's a phone call or a mailed statement. You may have to wait and or possibly reach out again because the patient forgot to call or stop in. You could check eligibility on Medicare's portal, hoping that the information, including the subscriber ID number, is listed for that Advantage plan. Once you have the correct information, you can refile the claim, but now you have spent and literally paid a great deal for your staff's effort. The scenarios I ran through can easily play into either type of patient. They both have many plans a patient can have coverage under outside of traditional Medicaid or traditional Medicare. And this is just the beginning, the true beginning of the pain points in dealing with these payers. Make sure you're credentialed and make sure you're enrolled with these payers for all plans under their offering. Medicare is always the best place to start with your credentialing process for any payer. Several medical plans, including Medicaid in some states, will not credential you unless you are approved or at least in processing with Medicare. Stay on top of your CAQH. Don't let that lapse. Almost all insurances rely on the data within CAQH to keep your credentialing status current. The dangers of not staying on top of credentialing range from not getting paid, the claims processing out of network, meaning a higher out-of-pocket expense for your patient, and lost time in reapplying and waiting for the approval process. Dig into eligibility and benefits. This is crucial. Ask, is this traditional Medicaid or a managed care plan? When thinking of this, you have to think of it as a completely separate insurance, even though the patients are walking in saying, I have Medicaid. You'll ask, what is your insurance? The patient replies, I have Medicaid. Yes, they do have it, but for whatever reason, those patients don't always walk away knowing what plan they are enrolled in. A lot of times the plan is based on eligibility on things like income, work status, life event and that can change month to month for some. Some Medicaid managed care members can have co-pays, co-insurance, and deductibles. There's a misconception that all Medicaid automatically means no patient out of pocket. Medicare or Medicare Advantage. It's not uncommon for individuals to not understand or realize that they signed up for an Advantage plan. A lot of times, senior citizens are invited to a coffee and donuts kind of chat by their insurance agent or by an insurance company representative. They are presented information about an Advantage plan, and a lot of times they sign up without fully knowing how or what they've done. Mind you, I'm sure it's all done appropriately, and what I mean is that even the patients sometimes have a hard time understanding that, yes, you still have Medicare, but it's a different Medicare. So when they go to the doctor, they should now pull out this blue cross card instead of their traditional Medicare. And if it's billed to Medicare, it's going to be denied. You should also be aware that each state is different with their offerings and their plans. Understanding the plan. You have to understand the plans and the differences because oftentimes your patients don't. They walk in with a Medicare or a Medicaid card and they're expecting you to understand it all, even though it's their insurance plan. Details of the plan change from year to year, month to month. What was covered at the last visit might not be covered in this visit. If you picture an umbrella, Medicaid sits at the very top, and then you have the spines that go down, and those represent all of the different plans. There's HMO plans, there's Badger Care. There's plans just for women dealing with pregnancy and family planning. There's QMB plans. And depending on your eligibility, depending on your work status, depending on your income, case reviewers can go through and verify what plan you actually do qualify for month by month. The patient's ID won't change, but often the coverage can. 
Do you know it's covered? If you don't, you're not going to have a clean claim and process start to finish. So what will happen is insurance will deny and the denial will say that they have different coverage by another payer or something to that effect. That starts the ball rolling. Okay, did the office get copies of the insurance cards at the time of the visit? Were all of the insurance details updated in the patient chart? I think that's very important. Can the biller see what's in there to determine, oh, okay, this was actually Blue Cross Medicare and not just a traditional plan? If they don't know on the front end to try to get all of the copies of the cards from the patients, and even if somebody missed that, then it's ultimately calling the patient and having that conversation, but it's on the back end now. These MCO and Advantage plans can have different timely filing rules. Traditional Medicare has one year, but an Advantage plan may only have 90 days. So time can be ticking away as you try to get the correct information and the claim filed. You don't know what you don't know. You don't ask because you don't know what to ask. Training and education are crucial for the staff and your patients to get it right the first time. Understanding Medicare ABN forms. ABNs have to be completed for patients where you suspect or expect that Medicare will deny a service that may have coverage. ABN forms are not needed for excluded benefits such as refraction. The biggest area offices fail in billing with ABN forms is for glasses after cataract surgery. You must list out the covered items, the non-covered items. Medicare will pay a certain dollar amount towards a frame. The patient is responsible for the overage, and that overage should be billed with a V2025 as an example. I do have some resources listed here that have some good education and guides in how to complete ABN forms. At the, or towards the end of our presentation, I will have an email address displayed. If you would like a copy of these links, I'm happy to send them to you if you just shoot me off an email for that. Are you asking detailed questions about what's included under each plan? You should be asking what's covered under their medical policy. Is the policy HMO or PPO, MCO or Advantage plan? Is an authorization or referral needed? If your office does frequent ancillary testing, are they covered? Fundus photos and visual fields, for example. Are there visit limitations for certain conditions like glaucoma or diabetes? If the medical policy has vision coverage, are there exclusions to that? Can an optometrist bill the services? Because there are plans out there that will only accept vision claims from an OMD. And do the copays fall under a primary care or a specialist? That's important information that the office would need to know prior to ever seeing that patient. The office may not be in network with that managed care plan or advantage plan. They may not have out-of-network benefits available. Take that next step to make sure that you are aware of what the credentialing status is and what benefits are available based on that. Take advantage of the Medicaid and Medicare portals. You can find the most relevant information on the portals most times. Oftentimes, though, offices lose access to the portals due to their strict security policies regarding access and password changes. Don't let that happen to you. Make sure all patient details are correct. Update the plans if they change. The gold standard would be to make things really smooth. That phone call to gather all the demographic details and insurance explanation would happen before the visit. The night before or possibly the morning of if it was an afternoon appointment if everything was going smoothly, that eligibility would be checked. Does that happen everywhere? No, it doesn't. When the patient comes in, you should always re-verify everything and get any cards that they have and scan them in. I have offices that scan in dental cards. 
I don't really need it, but I'm happy that they're scanning everything in. And in some cases, dental plans do offer vision discounts, so I suppose that is a good thing. Take all their cards, including a driver's license, and scan it in. Proper and correct legal name is important. Your patient may go by Cheyenne, but everywhere else their name is really Mary. Cheyenne just happens to be their middle name. Insurances in general want the right name, but Medicare and Medicaid tend to be more strict on that. Some other common mishaps, missing middle initial or transposing the numbers of a birth date. So again, that driver's license is important to be able to verify that information. Be your doctor's advisor. Partner with them to make sure they get all of the coding right. If you see errors or potential for errors, point them out. If you have a good service and you have a good delivery of service, that biller should be educating you on payer rules and payer requirements as they're coming across things. This is ensuring that the billing is going out correctly every time. It normally falls to the biller to truly watch out and protect their doctors and ultimately the patient. Payer rules to watch for with Medicare and Medicaid generally include medically necessary diagnosis for certain medical tests, Visit limitations for ancillary testing like 92133-92134. One to two visits per year are allowed depending on stage of glaucoma for 92133, and more may be allowed for 92134 for some retinal diseases. There are some Medicaid plans that require S codes for billing rather than the 920 or 99 codes and some have different billing requirements for minors versus adults. The follow-up is important. I think we've detailed why the upfront portion of the process is important, but sometimes you can only do so much upfront. There will be some follow-up on the back end as well. It's taking those denials and understanding what the denial code is really telling you understanding what adjustment is being applied, understanding if this is really truly the patient's responsibility. If this claim is denied, can it be corrected and refiled? It's doing that due diligence and not just giving up. Document the process. Make that claim tell the doctor a story because there is a story behind everything that happened. As I said earlier, if you would like the links for the ABN information or a guide on QMB information, um, I'm happy to send that to you. Um, here is the uh, sales information or the email information again for that. And I will hand this over to Paul. All right, thanks, Christine. Appreciate the, uh, the very detailed content. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna do a Q&A session. So uh, if you can find the question panel uh, in the GoToWebinar, uh, application, you can start entering those questions now. Uh, and while those are coming in and we're collating the questions, um, I'd like to do a, just kind of a, a quick overview uh, for you on the services that uh, we have here at RevCycle Partners. Uh, RevCycle Partners provides outsourced billing service for both medical and vision claims, including uh, Medicare and Medicaid topics of today. Um, we, we really, th you think about it as we become a an extension of your team and we you know, we take care of everything from you know scrubbing and filing the claims to you know posting your ob submitting secondaries uh chase and rejected claims we'll work your old aged uh, uh you know insurance ar uh, so it's really a full service uh billing uh, offering uh and uh throw a poll up here basically just uh, make it easy for us to uh filter out folks that uh, might want us to chat with them and, and get more information about us. So if you could fill that out, that'd be great. Um, in addition to the billing services, we, uh, you know, we also have a full set of credentialing services, um, whether it be, you know, adding a doctor to a panel, uh, taking care of an associate OD, um, uh, an acquisition, a new location, the variety of things that uh, uh, practices require credentialing on. We have services to take care of that. 
And uh, we're also um, in, in the process of building and launching a new service around patient eligibility verification. Christine alluded to you know, some of the issues that come up because of the mistakes on the front end. And so we're branching into that and, and we'll be, uh, uh, you'll be hearing more about that in the next uh, coming months. Um, so let me close out the poll there. Uh, and with that, we'll start uh, taking questions and make sure the team here is unmuted uh, and they are so let me uh, let me start here's the first one uh, for you guys um, uh, basic question is what is QMB you alluded to that I think Christine in the presentation there's a little little misunderstanding of what that is or unknowing of what that is yes I did and I also indicated a document that I'm happy to send out regarding that too to anybody that's interested um, so QMB is a Qualified Medi Medicare Beneficiary. It's basically a program where um, they will cover the cost of the Medicare premiums, and it also indicates that the patient will have no responsibility towards deductibles and coinsurance that uh, Medicare would process to. Um, you know that that's in in a nutshell. It it does extend uh, you know extend out. There are some questions that we've uh, dealt with too as a service on whether or not QMB uh, matters for practices that are not Medicaid providers. And that answer is yes. QMB does does apply to you or pertain to you even if you are not. A Medicaid provider, um, but again, I do have a, a document, a, fee, a FAQ that I'm happy to send out to anybody that would like more information. Uh, great. A <clears throat> um, couple of questions on our uh, Medicare. There's one is, um, how can I tell the difference between our Medicare and traditional Medicare with the new ID cards? And then a another question on the topic is, how do you, how do you get paid for our our, our Medicare? So maybe you guys can weave those together. Yeah, I can definitely help with that question. Um, so I, I assume that the question coming from uh, the how to tell the difference between railroad Medicare and traditional Medicare. And previously, we were able to simply look at the ID number and tell that there was a, an alpha suff or prefix to that ID number. And that would typically indicate that that was processed by railroad rather than the traditional Medicare. Since they've updated the ID cards now, there is no way to display distinguish traditional versus railroad Medicare by that ID number alone, uh, which is why it's very vital to actually obtain a copy of the Medicare card, because the only thing that's going to distinguish that is going to be the actual railroad Medicare logo, and that should be listed on the bottom of the Medicare card. Um, regarding how to get paid for railroad Medicare, um, that is a separate department of Medicare itself that you would actually need to credential with separately um, outside of just the traditional Medicare. Great, thanks. Um, let's see, here's another one. I have a denial from Medicaid stating the patient cannot be a dependent, but the patient is a minor. How do I fix that? Okay, so to me, that sounds like how the information is entered into the software. So even though the patient is a minor, they are considered self when it comes to Medicaid. That is also true for Medicare. Um, they have their own ID numbers. It is their plan. Um, so even though they're a minor, you would still want to make sure your um, patient has entered and you had a guarantor in place because that person is a minor, but when it comes to billing the insurance, you want to make sure that you are entering them in as a self. All right. Uh, let's see, trying to group a couple of these together. A couple questions around uh, Medicare and cataract surgery. Um, <clears throat> one is I'm getting credentialed with Medicare, but keep getting denials when I send a claim for glasses after cataract surgery. And the other one is, will Medicare cover for refraction after cataract surgery? So maybe you guys can weave those together. Okay, uh, I'll take off with the first one here. Uh, so credentialing with Medicare, just kind of like I mentioned previously with the railroad Medicare, um, when you're credentialed with the traditional Medicare, you will still need to credential with the Department of Medicare that would process those types of services. So glasses after cataract surgery, they're going to be covered uh, or considered 
medically necessary by Medicare, but they should be processing with their durable medical equipment department. Um, and that is going to still require an additional enrollment. Um, and you will have a specific PTAN for your traditional Medicare, a specific PTAN for your DME Medicare, and a different PTAN for your railroad Medicare, depending on if you're credentialed with all three. The second part to that, I believe, was a question regarding um, Medicare covering refraction after cataract surgery. Correct. Was that correct, yep. Paul? Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, I believe that is not necessarily covered as a separate benefit. Medicare never traditionally covers refraction. And when they look at um, that final refraction coming from a, a cataract post-op, they do include that as payment um, considered in that that lump sum payment for the total care in the global period um, during that post-op claim that we initially file. Okay. Uh, another railroad question. Do we have to bill differently on the 1500 form for railroad Medicare? So typically railroad Medicare follows the same rules and the same guidelines as traditional Medicare. So you shouldn't have to bill differently on the, the 1500 form. Um, I'm not sure if there's a, a specific situation that you've got going on. And um, if you'd like to send that, uh, you know, your question specific into uh, the email listed below, um, I'd be happy to um, talk with you more on that. But um, traditionally that, or typically that answer is no, um, you wouldn't bill any differently. Okay, here's a, a longer one. Let me uh, let me just kind of read through it and see if you guys can catch it. If I am a Medicare provider, but not a Blue Cross Blue Shield provider, and a patient has Blue Cross uh, Advantage, uh, can I bill Medicare? That kind of comes back to some of the points that Christine mentioned early on, and, and being aware of those Advantage plans prior to you know rendering services because if you are not in network and credentialed with that payer um, that should be the point that you reach out to them and ask them if that patient has out of network benefits available for that service um, if they do have those out of network benefits available do they require an a prior authorization um, and, and see you know how to handle that claim with your current credentialing status with that payer so okay. the, the, the short answer is no. Um, you can't bill Medicare if they have a, a Blue Cross Advantage plan. You would have to be you would have to be credentialed or um, understand the out of network benefits if they're available. Okay. And here, here's another one that is uh, kind of multi payer Medicare and another payer. Says I, if I'm a Medicare and United Healthcare provider and a patient has UHC Advantage, does the claim only go to UHC? If that claim, if they, sorry, Christine, no, <laughs> do you no, want to no, take no. that one? Okay. No, no, no. The Advantage plan is actually a replacement of the traditional Medicare. So it actually takes place of that Medicare. And so you wouldn't actually bill the traditional, you would bill the Advantage plan in place of that. Got it. Um, okay, so we're getting close to the half hour, so I'll uh, ask for any last questions to be popped in here. We've got one more, but feel free to enter a last one or two if you got them. Um, and the question is, do you know how to negotiate with Medicaid reimbursement? Is, there, is it negotiable? Ah, that, uh, you know, that's a really great question. Um, to my knowledge or to my experience, those fees are set. Um, they're set by uh, geographic region area. Um, I I have not found a way to be successful or heard of a way to be successful in negotiating a, a different fee schedule with them. Um, Amanda, do you have any different experience? No, I, I would agree with that comment. Um, it, it is typically standard um, set per state and and we reference to those those specific fees per services and, and, and expect mm -hmm. those fees. Now, I think that we would question if we're not seeing that uh, reimbursement come in at that expected level. Um, but yeah, it is just that flat rate. And I think there too, if you have, you know, your local um, optometry associations and groups, um, you know, those would be a really good place to start as far as trying to initiate some change or looking for some help or additional resources and maybe how to get change to happen with that. All right. Um, 
And and here's a question. A quick follow up on that one, and then we'll call it a wrap. And his question is: Is what about vision companies? Can those be reneg uh, uh, renegotiated? So I'm assuming they're talking about VSP, IMED, et cetera. Yeah. Um, to my experience with that, um, those plans can usually be renegotiated. Um, it depends on the definitions listed inside of your contracts and, um, you know, what was negotiated out and how often those come up for revalidation and renegotiation. But, um, yeah, as far as I am aware, most of those are able to be negotiated. It's at least worth trying, right? Absolutely. Uh, all right. Okay, great. Well, we're we're past the half hour, and I think the questions are are wrapped up. There is one uh, one question about whether this will be recorded. Uh, somebody that joined late, it, and it is, and so everyone will get a link to, uh, to the recording on this. You'll be able to watch it again or uh, forward it to uh, one of your colleagues if if you'd like to do that. Um, uh, feel free to reach out to us at the email and the phone number, whether it's interested in our services or if there's uh, resources or content that uh, Christine alluded to that you would like copies of. Uh, we're just we're happy here to happy to be here to help uh, uh, in the, around these topics. Uh, again, thanks everybody for the time. Christine, Amanda, thank you for providing the content and answering all those questions. Uh, and uh, everybody have a great day. Thanks.